All right. Oh, there's Chloe. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this solidarity session um, about farming on other people's land. So lovely to have you all here. Um, I think I can hear somebody's TV. <laughs> if everybody could just um, maybe mute their microphones just for now. That'd be great. Awesome. Um, okay, before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm lucky enough to work, live and breathe upon, the Walbunja, Ewan, Saltwater peoples of the South Coast and New South Wales. I wish to acknowledge that they have sustainably managed this beautiful region for thousands of years and still do to this day. I give my thanks to elders past, present and emerging and to any First Nations peoples present today. So yeah, hello everybody. Um, my name's Eliza um, and I am one of the AFSA uh, National Committee members um, and I'll be facilitating this conversation today. Um, I would just like to start by getting everybody, if you could please write in the chat where you are coming from, that would be fantastic just so we can get an idea about where everybody is. Um, and I'll just do a quick bit of housekeeping before we get into the intros of our amazing panel. Um, if you could just keep your um, mics on mute throughout unless you're speaking, that would be fantastic. Um, if you're willing to share your video, that would be super lovely to see all of your faces, but I get it if it's been a long day. <laughs> uh, and yeah, oh, I think, um, Jess is here as well, who's our admin officer at AFSA, and um, she's going to be um, checking to see if you can raise your hand. I think there's a button in case you want to speak, um, so she'll be monitoring that. Um, but if you want to say anything or have any inputs at any point in time, you can also pop that in the chat and we'll try and get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, okay, I think we'll get crack. Oh, there's somebody else's audio. <laughs> um let me have a look I think yeah if you could just whack your audio on mute everybody that'd be great just so we don't hear any background noise cool okay we're gonna get into um some quick intros of our panel we've got a lot of amazing people um involved in this sphere um and I'm very excited for you to all hear about what they're getting up to. It's going to be super interesting. So um, let's start with Nadia. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm um, trying to grow vegetables and herbs in um, Little Ritter, Tasmania. Um, and yeah, there's um, it's a recent project. We started about 12 months ago and we're leasing land. Um, and there's three of us um, sharing resources and things together. And we do a veggie box and um, supply some kitchens in Hobart. Thanks, Nadia. Simone. Hi, guys. Um, so I work on a large farm over in Cape Shank on the Mornington Peninsula, uh, Bonnerong country in Victoria. Uh, I'm a chef by trade and came onto this beautiful property about three years ago with the mindset of opening a 40 seat greenhouse restaurant. But thanks to um, quite a few hurdles, including COVID, that's been uh, taken a little bit longer than we expected. So in the meantime, we've been developing um, what has sort of been a slow process of recognizing what is best both for um, the farm itself, the environment and young farmers of this area. So we've been developing a CSA model that will be um, allowing leases out from different areas on the farm, as well as um, selling the produce that's existing. So um, it's just been fun developing kind of those, those different models slowly and organically of, of what works best for everyone and weeding out, sorry, excuse the pun, <laughs> uh, weeding out the issues <laughs> as we go, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Thanks, Simone, love it. Can't wait to hear more about it. Um, Karina. Hey everyone, um, so I'm from Patchwork Urban Farm. We use people's backyards and front yards and verges a little bit around Canberra and we have around five backyards. We grow an assortment of vegetables and 
um, provide around 30, going, going up to 40 households this season. Um, yeah, a CSA box every week for around 30 weeks. And um, we do it, we sell it on a sliding scale so people can access the boxes no matter what financial circumstances they're in. Um, yeah, and I think we're going into our third season. Thanks, Karina. Josh and Rex. Hey, everyone. G'day. So, Josh and Rex. Um, yeah, we are Tumpanuri Growers. We've been share farming at Captain's Creek Organic Farm in Central Vic, Jaja Warren country for two years. This is our third season just starting now. Um, yeah, it's quite a well-established and well-respected farm in the region. Rod May, who took over the land from his father and his father and his father, I think it's fourth, fifth generation now. And he converted the family farm from conventional farming to organics in the eighties. So he was one of the pioneers in the organics. And when he passed tragically about five years ago, he left his land to his daughters and then they didn't want to farming, but wanted somebody to continue, to continue his legacy. So enter Tumpanieri Girls. Great, thanks guys. Um, next, Murray. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm Murray from Nuru Farm, uh, which is on the banks of the Yass River, just a bit north of Gundaroo. Um, coming to you from Nambri, Wallabalua and Pajong country. Um, and we're a beef cattle operation and doing a, um, a, a type of land sharing arrangement with a local First Nations family um, and learning a huge amount as we go along. So keen to share it with you a bit later today. Thanks, Murray. So excited to hear about that. Um, Katie Finlay. I don't know why I read your last name then. <laughs> well Katie. Done. Hi, hi everybody. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Harcourt Organic Farming Co-op. So my husband and he and I own, own the property. We used to um, grow organic fruit here and now we lease the whole farm out and we've got four different enterprises on the farm. Um, somebody leases the orchard, we've got a market garden, um, small uh, 10 cow dairy and a fruit tree nursery. And we are just going into the fourth year of nine year leases. So we've been set up and up and running for a while. Thanks. So good. Um, Chloe and Jared. Everyone, I'm Chloe. I'm Jared. And we're Dog Creek Growers. We're currently farm handing, working and um, living on Wurundjeri country, East Nam. Um, we have a small market garden, just about to enter our first season. Um, um, yeah, it's like a, it's mostly a goat, um, dairy goat farm. So we are um, leasing, I guess, in a different way of sort of, um, instead of using money, we are farm handing and swapping our labour for some land. So alternative alternative method there I love it um Carl well hello uh <laughs> Carl from Windfall Commons um near Malmesbury Central Victoria and uh here on behalf of uh, Grounded the Community Land Trust Advocacy Group we've just established we're working towards affordable housing and affordable farmland so we're uh, very interested to hear um, more about what you're all up to. Thanks, Carl. And nearly done. Joyce. Hi, I'm Joyce Wilkie. I'm managing and mentoring a teaching farm for a not-for-profit down on the south coast of Maruya. And we've been given uh, five acres by a local doctor on a 10-year lease for this project. Um, we're at this stage, we're going into the third season. Cool. Thanks, Joyce. All right. I think is Fraser here? I don't know. I just got a message from his partner, so we will see. Yeah, no, I'm here. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> hi, Fraser. I just got in the door. <clears throat> awesome. Hey, Kirst. Uh, what am I doing? Introducing myself. I'm Fraser, and we're me and Kirsty run Old Mill Road, and we are vegetable growers. Yeah. Is that? 
Yeah, that, that's great. Um, and I guess I should introduce myself as well. So my name is Eliza and I am one half of Borrow Ground. Um, I run it with my partner, Alex, and we lease land off Fraser and Kirsty um, of Old Mill Road and also Southland's uh, Fruit and Veg, which is our local um, green grocer as well. Um, okay, so I'll give everybody a little bit of a background, um, background information about what um, the subcommittee FUPL, which stands for Farming on Other People's Land, um, is about. Um, and then I'll talk about the aim of what we want to achieve from this chat, and then we'll get into um, an open kind of discussion about some things. So um, at the 2019 AGM, AFSA announced the creation of FUPL, a new channel and subcommittee to help grow new growers, support young farmers and facilitate access to land for aspiring growers all over Australia. FUPL also references that all non-Indigenous Australian farmers are farming on other people's land, first people's country. So FUPL activities support and encourage new farming ventures on existing farms and underutilized land, including support for young and new farmers to develop skills and tools for successful farm, into farm enterprises. Um, so it's a really kind of like, it's some really important work given the land access issues that we find, um, we find today. So um, yeah, finding kind of alternative alternative methods to land, um, I think is like the most relevant thing in terms of agriculture and young farmers or existing farmers trying to kind of um, continue or start their own ventures. Um, so what we want to get out of this kind of chat tonight is we want to hear about real lived experiences from different parties in this sphere that makes alternative routes to land access seem possible and attainable, as well as create a space that promotes the sharing of land share agreements and resources that can be used by future and existing growers looking to start or continue their farming ventures. So we'll um, get started in the chat now. Um, what I wanted to start off with was the topic of kind of bridging the tension that exists between the colonial um, the colonial existence of you know growing food on unceded land. Um, so I wanted to throw this over to Murray um, because he has started to build a, a consultative relationship with elders in his community, and I'd really like to hear what he has to say about that. And yeah, thanks, Murray. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I'll I'll, um, I'll try and summarise what is a um, fairly protracted and um, and long winded type of story. Um, we we came onto the farm uh, coming up to five years ago with no experience of farming, come out of um, corporate life, and as part of that journey, we um, that was kind of quite a quite a big life change for us and and. We had lots of positive influences in terms of people who gave us a, a helping hand to get going. Um, but one of the things that we, I think we quite struggled with fairly early on was this sort of sense of ownership and um, feeling that, um, you know, that, that notwithstanding that our names were on the title of this piece of land, um, that owning it, um, wasn't wasn't necessarily um, the right mindset, and and um, finding ways to resolve that um, led us um, on a path towards um, the establishment of a relationship with a local Nambri family, um, and that has been a pretty interesting journey for us. Um, I think we we feel as if we've got a lot more out of it than perhaps what Girawa and his family have. But nevertheless, um, what it's about is recognising that um, the country that we, we sit on um, is there for all time. Um, it's, it, it, it doesn't, in a, um, in a long-term sense, it doesn't really belong to anybody because um, as, as we all do, we all move on at some point. And so <clears throat> reconciling, <clears throat> pardon me, reconciling with our own personal um, history and 
relationship with First Nations people, um, it was an opportunity for us to do what we felt was right. And that was to open the farm gate and to build a relationship which has led to a, um, a situation where um, Girawa and his family have, have the opportunity to share the farm with us in terms of what they want to do, whether that's a cultural experience uh, for themselves or whether that turns into an economic enterprise for, for them and their community down the track. Um, the reason Gira was not here today is a complex one. And I can only, with his permission, I can only speak for him. I don't speak for any other First Nations people who may be on the call because the lived experience of every single person who confronts the issue of land um, comes at it from different perspectives. But from Paul's perspective, from Girawa's perspective, um, he feels stateless. And as a result of feeling stateless, he, he feels a loss of dignity in the conversation about land. And so he, he, he is very happy that this conversation is happening. He's very happy for me to talk about it and, and to talk uh, for and on behalf of him, but um, th 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 there's, there's a complex set of reasons why he'd prefer to, um, to have me um, as a settler um, having this conversation with you. Um, in terms of the future, we're um, building at the moment an interesting project to uh, enliven the ancient grain belt um, that exists obviously throughout uh, Australia, uh, which is obviously a women's business um, project. And so we're seeking to create a festival of ancient grains at the farm in um, January uh, and to restore and enliven the, the, the old stories that surround that, that beautiful um, uh, food story around, around um, the various native native grains that we have here, um, and and so that is just a it's just I guess an extension of the relationship and the partnership that we have that we're trying to bring local mob into it, um, trying to leverage um, young engineers from the ANU to 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 lean into that and provide. Uh, technological solutions to ancient challenges um, and to help uh, give a leg up to potential future economic enterprises that um, we can um, co-create for the benefit of First Nations people. And then more broadly, and, and, and I'll, I'll just conclude um, my brief remarks with, with um, I guess the broader project that that he and I and a few others are working on, and that is to find financial models that would facilitate um, the the First Nations people being able to to leverage into farm ownership, um, <clears throat> and that's that sort of land piece is a hugely important. Uh, and obviously controversial topic, but until until Australia can resolve uh, itself around um, this this land issue, um, we we are going to struggle to make the sort of progress that we want to make. So so this is this is about um, new and innovative models um, centered on uh, finance and different different contributors funding pools and et cetera, et cetera, that would create opportunities for First Nations people uh, to, to uh, um, uh, get into um, farm ownership. So I might, I might leave it there. Um, thanks, Eliza. Thanks, Murray. That was um, like, I'm sure it was extremely succinct, but I'm sure, you know, 
there's it's such a massive picture and kind of mission that you're on and it sounds I mean it's so important how can I just ask a question how how you established this relationship and built trust was it just over time and like being dedicated and you know like this relationship that you've created with this family do you have any kind of I mean it's going to be different obviously for every different context but do you have any kind of um advice to people that are yeah in this conversation yeah right now? yeah that's a it's, a it's a great question um what I would say uh, and and forgive me because this this group I'm talking to today you know you guys are you're so centered on these topics already you know I'm not I'm not I'm not preaching here at all I just share my own personal experience and perhaps share my own naivety um, as I came into this um, I thought that it would be relatively straightforward um, what I discovered of course um, obviously is that the east coast of Australia from the top to the bottom is where settler impact was at its greatest arguably and so as a result of that the communities the culture the language and everything around that is extremely dislocated um, and 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 all of those things um, that that go around that and so um, starting with the local land council starting with the the um, the, the united elders group you you, you quickly get rejections and those rejections are very polite rejections um, you know I've, I've got to commend the indigenous community for for um, you know continuing to show up and continuing to to um, to uh, present that kind of front but but it's it's unsurprising that there's suspicion um, from their side towards people like me who are you what do you want um, and and what could possibly be in it for us and and so it was it was just a long journey of working through um the the the, the local group and and essentially finding somebody who was prepared um to give me a go and to to um to, to have a closer look at it but i i think that the settler really the the, the white guy for want of a better word, really has to do the legwork here. You, you, you have to have the resilience to push on and, and urge um, for uh, the relationship to occur. Um, it's just, it's, an, it's a very uneven playing field um, where, you know, we, 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 we or I um, hold, 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 hold the, well, as Giro would say, that the, the, the deck the deck is stacked. And so you've got to be able to find those ways to break it down and you've got to be able to find the ways to hang in there and, and um, with generosity and, and, and all of those things and patience and respect. Um, these things take time to develop, um, but hugely rewarding um, uh, down the track. Thanks so much, Murray, for sharing all that. It's given us a lot like such a small amount of time, I think it's going to give a lot of people a lot of um, ideas and inspiration. So thank you so much. Um, okay, moving on to examples of stories, um, sorry, examples of stories of successes or challenges um, in existing land sharing and share farming enterprises. Also wanted to hear from anyone that is a part of a collective model, um, so I'm going to put this out there, stories of successes and challenges, I guess, to either Katie and Simone um, or Joyce, Josh and Rex. So hand up. There we go. Josh. Yeah, I suppose we can um, start out by a, a more difficult, I suppose, journey. Um, some challenges and I think a lot of our challenges are due to um, the handover being that when Rod May passed away and left it to his daughters they just inherited this massive asset with a lot of responsibility and a lot of um, ins and outs that they weren't wanting or able to continue as, as, 
as a farming enterprise as such. So they were kind of seeking somebody to continue that. It was, uh, it sat idle for a, for a period and then we came along and then to, as new farmers with new ideas, wanting to continue a legacy, but none of us really knowing what to do and what things were worth and how much rent should we be, be paying and all these complicated issues I've found to be extremely challenging and when looking for other examples that we could kind of get some positives and negatives from, we couldn't find any in Australia. There was some in Canada and a few other countries, North America are quite good on these things now, but it's a very new space in Australia. And I suppose not to harp on how difficult it has been in our specific um, case, but positives to come out of it, I see are we would like to share our story far and wide and open up our books and our um, our ins and outs of, of exactly what we've gone through. And I'd, I'd like to have other farmers around the nation do the same and share their stories and show their books and figures. I, I love the idea of radical transparency. Um, we, we try to live by that and show everybody exactly what we're doing, what it takes to produce food. And yeah, it's a bit of a call out for help. Like I, I think there could be much better systems put in place. Pupil's quite, young and we really respect the assistance that we have received in, in and we have received some assistance but it's just that it's a really difficult complicated space on an individual level but i think that we can collectivize a lot better and and help one another with these challenging setups we are mainly new young farmers looking to start new exciting journeys and farming as we all know is difficult enough as it is and access to land is near impossible so we have to be this generation of negotiators and figure out how we can provide food to communities in ethical ways so for us it's just a matter of opening up our arms and, and books and showing people what we've been through um, we just need platforms to be able to do that and collectives to get together and and do the same so yeah i think that that's such an important point and it's we're essentially i feel like in this space we're essentially a blank can like a blank canvas as you said you know the northern hemisphere have got like you know heaps of different kind of um, models that around this kind of way of um, producing food um, so I think yeah what has really stuck with me just over even our last conversation on Monday was that we need to create like a resource bank of of transparent agreements um, coming from not even only just lease agreements but the finances so that people can access stories. i think the stories are really important for new yeah, the stories as well and like i'm a big proponent of podcasts and audible learning and if i had the chance to speak to somebody with a, a list of questions of what we've been through and we could record that and put it onto a resource bank and get others to do the same i, I feel that would be a really powerful way to uh, assist new and, and emerging farmers to navigate really tricky spaces because when you hear people share their stories I feel it hits a lot harder than just reading through people's documents and trying to tease yeah. out the information it's it can be drowning so yeah, yeah I think that, that storytelling aspect is a huge part of farming yeah no I completely agree it's already an isolating kind of <laughs> um career sometimes so like if we can make it um more inclusive and accessible and um yeah I think I really like that idea about the storytelling side of things I'm the same as you I respond way better than reading a thousand documents so thank you so much and definitely I've written that down and um I'll work towards that for sure um okay and then Simone did you have a few words on that yeah look um I come from like a kind of unique situation where I'm not the landowner or the leasee or sort of collective member. And from that, I guess that's made it um, a little bit simpler because I've had the opportunity to be the one facilitating and mediating a lot of the issues that we've sort of come across. And look, they haven't been issues. They've just been challenges that we've had to slowly work through as they arise. And like, I completely agree with Josh. Like, when I was looking at different models, it was largely from listening to podcasts that were from overseas. And mm. there was always similarities, but it's like, well, that's not quite like our farm. That's not quite what I think our community needs. And I think like, even if there was to be like a little bit of a template, there is just so many independent things on each farm that vary, that have variables. So um, that's where like, I've just had that time to work through some of those slowly and sort of go, well, 
the land sharing part was actually the easiest thing to decide of you know what the owner wanted to charge per square meter and what it was to include was what became very difficult of like minor machinery major machinery irrigation all those sort of things of like sort of there was no one to talk to of going but do you include that or how much do we charge for that or do we charge for that at all and um it's it's really only because I've had the time because I'm only farming sort of part-time for and doing cooking and events I'm not um you know leasing and trying to run my own business that I've had the backspace and headspace to to work through those things and go well this is what it could look like and and then work together to sort of put some garden guidelines together and the legislation that um, has become our community garden agreement, which originally we were sort of looking at a, a land sharing um, sublease, but after sort of speaking to some lawyers and chatting to other people, the, the community garden lease um, allowed our farmers to have um, a much longer term. So that it's an open-ended lease um, and it was just a lot simpler. Everything from the sublease stuff standard, it was all just very, uh, I don't know, we, the other thing that we sort of have spoken through a lot is our, our values and what and how we can all work together on, on making sure that that's where we're heading, not just at all being about like this is included and that's included. We all want to be on the same level. So mediating personalities and yeah, different humans has been a, a large part of it, which I wouldn't say has been a challenge, but um, it has certainly been something that I didn't kind of expect to be as big a aspect of managing a collective as it has been but um i'm sure because we haven't actually had our first season we're going into it now so it's like all being set up i'm sure if we had this conversation in six months time my challenges list might be a little bit longer but <laughs> yeah that's sort of where where i'm sitting at the moment i think the interpersonal um aspect to a model like yours is it's quite often forgotten about when you're dealing with people there's so many different other kind of like um outliers and curveballs that can come into place and of course when you're kind of trying to organize something where you're all going to be accepted accepting of of course you've got to take into account personalities and your values and stuff so that's yeah that's interesting that you raise that because I think sometimes people can forget about that and just go straight to the you know the legal like things and just like bullet points and stuff like that but it's kind of important to have that social emotional aspect to an agreement as well I think yeah, we went through like a, a holistic decision making flow chart and sort of put together our core values as a, as a collective and as individuals and have included it in our garden guidelines that are signed off as part of being the being part of the collective. So it's like you're not just agreeing to, to you know, silly rules. You're you're agreeing to being part of um, something that's spiritual as well as practical. So I think that's a, a really important part of what we're doing here. Yeah, so good. Thanks, Simone. Um, da, 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 Katie. Thanks, Eliza. Um, a, very interesting hearing everybody else. We've got two levels to ours. So we've got the leases between us as the landowners and all of our lessees. And we did really nut out the, the dot points to start with. And we're very clear in the leases, it was a painful process to go through, but as soon as we had them signed and in the drawer, everyone then relaxed at about knowing that everyone's very clear about exactly what they've got access to and how much it's gonna cost them. So yes, it's painful and bureaucratic to go through at the beginning, but totally worth it. We've then got a second layer, which for us is a co-op. That's just the structure we've chosen, wouldn't suit everybody, but that's where we work out um, the interpersonal stuff and the values and the HM, you know, we've also done HM decision-making, which we came to later. We did have that, those initial values discussions four or five years ago when we started, but then you have to live with each other and that's where you actually do come up against those challenge and challenges and that's, that is a much more evolving thing. But getting all that legal stuff dealt with first in our experience was really worthwhile. It's been... Um, very, very clear for each other. Just a couple of other quick things that I want to say. Um, we have learned a couple of unintended consequences of our, our model, which um, are that we've, we've created, we accidentally created a disincentive for capital investment on the land because us as landowners um, don't particularly want to put a lot of money into capital investment 
when we don't want to put our leases up so we can't recoup the costs of, of things like kangaroo fencing and netting and driveway upgrades and all that sort of stuff. Um, so we're still working out some of those issues, how we actually pay for things or, or do we do them. And the second one, which is really big, um, is that our farm, so we've got nine-year leases. We're four years into, into our nine-year leases, but very, very conscious that our farmers are not building equity. And they're also not running profitable enough businesses to be saving to build equity. And so that's a real long-term issue I see, or, you know, that we as landowners see for this younger generation who are farming on other people's land. And it's interesting, it kind of touches on Murray, what Murray was talking about as well, that so we're going to do, that's one of the next pieces of work that we want to do is how do we resolve that? Not only with our existing young farmers, but we've also got a bush foods group. We've made connections with our local mob as well. Um, you know, we've got five kids. Our kids don't have any more right to this land than we do. That you know, that, why should they inherit it rather than our local indigenous mob? Like, some really big questions there. So, um, and and this also just connects quickly with uh, what Josh was saying about needing specific resources so our lease is on the AFSA website but it's there's no dollars in there um, but we're very happy to share them it's just that I didn't want to share our lessees um, information on that we just haven't been that through that process yet of asking them if that's okay to share it but everybody's pretty open um, on our place so we're really happy at this stage just for people to get in touch with us and um, uh, and we can share how we figured out those numbers because we lease to so many different enterprises we've got real it's not just a dollars per hectare or anything or dollars per, per square meter we had a very different model to work that out and it just just about turned my brain inside figuring out how we were going to do that um inside out uh and the other thing is that we we can't announce it yet but we have just got some funding to actually create a whole lot of resources about how we've got to where we are which will be open source resources. We'll be sharing them with everybody. I don't know how yet through it, through the co-op website probably, but maybe also through AFSA. All right, I'll stop there. Thanks. That's so exciting. Yay. Yeah, it's really exciting. Oh, <laughs> that's really gonna that, that'll be amazing. Cool. Yeah. Um, I guess the biggest thing that stood out for me there was um like how you were reiterating that having kind of like overly transparent contracts with with people because I mean, I know that when Fraser, Alex, Kirsty, and I were creating our lease agreement, we were just like, you know, this probably isn't going to happen, but let's just chuck it in anyway, because when we don't chuck it in, that's when Absolutely. it's going to happen. And then like it, shit will hit the fan. Yeah. And I think that's what was really beneficial. Um, and I guess, yeah, beneficial when we were creating that, that lease agreement with Old Mill, because we also had a land share agreement previous to that where we didn't well, it was essentially a handshake and we thought we were all mates and it kind of just went pear-shaped so it, like it always drastic. does yeah so <laughs> no I, think, I shouldn't say that doesn't and it always, seems so this... simple as well it seems so like it seems so obvious you're like oh um yep. but Fraser, like what how did you feel about when we were co-creating that lease agreement Fraser? like how did you find that process can you hear He's not here. <laughs> Sorry, me. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> but you bailed on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, uh, that was easy for me because I'd done it twice before with Soul Patch and Full Crum Farm. So okay. with, with they leased the paddock over the front and uh, Martin was the first. We, we like Katie said, it was just painful. We went through... Uh, we tried to identify all the clash points where we might clash our personalities um, and then, you, you know, and then, um, and those were all farm related anyway. So it was kind of like, okay. And then that was tweaked with the next grower, Kyle. Um, and that agreement was pretty tight. You know, there wasn't anything there, but that was a two way street as well well like we, if i put something in it was like with consultation and vice versa and that agreement went backwards and forwards probably like ours did eliza a few times until we were happy with it right yeah cool all right um a question from georgina oh yes sorry georgina 
Hi guys. Um, it actually wasn't a question. It was more a comment to what Josh was talking about. And I think everyone else on the call is talking about, I'm, I, can't, I do lots of work for young farmers in terms of advocacy and all different sorts of things. But one of them is currently working for an NGO called Farmers Footprint Australia. We launched about six months ago, seven months ago. My timing's not good. Um, and one of the things we're really passionate about, which is what we've heard relentlessly, is this need to share stories and having a platform to share stories, especially when it comes to the social and ecological side of the impact rather than the predominantly economic impact that we've sort of seen the stories and stats on. So, I mean, it's multifaceted, but a big part of that is young farmers and something we're extremely passionate about. Um, it coincides well with an incubator program I'm currently designing for the Northern Rivers at the moment, addressing all of these, which was actually in response to, I can see Madison's on the call, was actually in response to Young Farmers Connect regeneration uh, report done last year, I think it was 2021, with Tanya Massey about the barriers to farming incubator programs in Australia and young farmers. Um, so basically what I'm going to do, it's a plug that I'm going to put my email in the chat. And if anyone's interested in telling their story or want someone to talk to or platforms and et cetera, et cetera, please reach out. Um, we've been inundated with the most incredible stories that we know are out there. Um, and it's a great problem to have that there's too many to tell in the amount of weeks in the year. Um, but we'd love to hear more and, and I'll put my personal email address in. So please reach out and we can have a chat. Oh, thanks so much, Georgina. That's really exciting. And I'm sorry it took so long to get <laughs> to you. <laughs> um, I just want to, I'm mindful of time. We've still got a couple of things I want to chat about. Um, so barriers, I'm going to put this to Joyce. Like, what do you think are the biggest barriers to land access? And what do you think some practical actions and solutions to combat these could be? Um, Joyce, and then obviously anybody else that has any ideas or thoughts. Joyce, you're just muted. Oh, where is she? I can't see her face. <laughs> Am I there? Am I back online? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I'm in an interesting situation because for the best part of 35 years, I farm my own farm. And latterly, we, we mentored a number of people that have gone on to be really great farmers. And um, most of them have gone on to borrowed land. Um, just because, you know, all the reasons that you guys know about that land is so expensive. Um, the shoe's kind of on the other foot now because I'm working on a farm which is, um, it's, it's not land that we own. Um, and um, I think one of, one of our, as a teaching farm, as an incubator farm, one of our next goals is to start turning people onto um, finding opportunities for young people to take up borrowed land. And we have, because of, you know, the fact that we're, we're the SAGE is quite a big organization um, and that's the Stepping Stone is SAGE's teaching farm. Um, a lot of people have heard about us and they're coming, we're finding people are coming to us with offers of land. I think in many cases that, the people that are offering land to young farmers don't really have their head around what's actually involved. It's kind of like a nice idea, um, but I think it gets, so what we're doing is trying to mentor people through that transition period and talk, like be an intermediary for them, um, moving on to land that we we go and assess to start with. But I, I I think there's lots of interesting things that have come up in the discussion to, that, you know, I'm, I'm just, my head's kind of buzzing with ideas and stuff, but, but I'll come back to the contract. And I think this contract evolution is interesting because Fraser is actually on the steering committee for the farm I teach at, and he was in a position to negotiate the contract with the landowner who donated the land. And that has been a wonderful thing. Um, so that the, the contract itself was in a fairly mature place by the time, um, you know, it was on the table between um, Martin and Sage. And 
yes, there's always stumbles. You, the, the things that, that annoy you are inevitably not in the contract. You can't think of everything. But if you have a contract and it's a well thought, thought through con, a contract, these little stumbling blocks um, become much easier to get over because you've got something concrete there to talk from and to springboard off. Um, but one of the things, the other thing that's come our way is that there is land around here that um, Indigenous people um, have access to. And um, one of the things I'd like to do in the near future is, is to make some relationships with Indigenous locals and see if we can get some, some young Indigenous people onto the farm and then go forward into land which they probably feel more ownership for us. So Murray, what Murray was saying has really interested me because um, and this is also the first time I've lived in a place where, I mean, there's Indigenous people that walk up and down my street every night, every day. Um, All Sun Farm, I had very, very little contact with um, any of the Ngunnawal people that, um, and particularly no contact with them with regard to land ownership or anything like that. Um, but I think the land, I, I think the land is out there. I think we just need to be having some educated conversations with people who have land and who want to use it in different and innovative ways. And I think the storytelling is really useful because if we if we've got the examples of success stories and we've got we've got exa yeah, examples of things that have worked that that just makes it easier. It will get easier. I think I don't think it's the, the lack of the land. Yeah, really great points, Joyce. I think I think it's about trying to find find an equilibrium between people yeah. wanting to grow food and then the people that have land and being super realistic about the situation. Because like I know my friends, um, some of my friends in the Blue Mountains, it's the same thing. Like they got land, but then they thought that it was all going to be okay. And like there was a contract, but then just, you know, personalities clash and ideal ideals clash as well. And it's just like, it's really difficult to try and find, yeah, that balance, I guess. If anybody has any ideas, I think it's more about <laughs> personality tests before you do anything. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, thanks, Joyce. Also, yeah, I've been thinking about um, that when I was working at the high school. There's, remind me, please, to tell you about the Clontarf um, group. I can try and link you in with them. Um, okay, time, time, time. So I just wanted to hear quickly from um, Chloe, Jared, and um, Nadia, and maybe Karina. Probably won't have time for all of you. But just um, what are your experiences as young farmers on lease land? How did you um, how did you kind of locate where you were going to be, and how did you build those connections? Yeah, how did you um, acquire your spots? I guess um, I'll put it to Nadia first. Hello. Um, yeah, so um, I was really fortunate to get um, me and a couple of other people um, offered uh, from a retired farmer who was retiring, um, who's really a big local food advocate and a young farmer advocate. Um, so it made it very easy. Um, and he's letting us lease on his land using all his infrastructure. It's an existing market garden. Um, but because it's a really new project, um, we don't have any um, written agreements or anything. It's all verbal. Um, and for all the reasons that you've just talked about, we're really keen to um, get a written agreement um, for all the things that we've just talked about and the security. Um, yeah, and so we, that's that we find really challenging because we don't know how much to invest in the space because we don't know um, what the long-term um plan is um he's got kids um and then and he's really old he's like 85 and he's like yeah I'm gonna die soon yeah, like he's so he's he's he 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 doesn't want to commit to anything just yet because of you know he's got to figure stuff out himself um so yeah that just is creating a bit of stress and challenge for us knowing how much to invest um in this space yeah 
yeah, that's, I guess, one of the biggest um, kind of instabilities is that security, hey, making sure that everything is portable. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Noodles. Um, Karina. Yeah, so like I said earlier, with Patchwork, we use people's backyards, front yards and verges in the city. And we found them just through creating like a little flyer on Facebook and Instagram. And then people, like we had way more people contact us than we could actually take on, which was pretty exciting. Um, and I guess like we then kind of narrowed down what our actual options wanted to be. So we tried to go for places that were bigger and had really good um, access or like, yeah, the um, like really good sun and mm. easy to install things. And um, the actual arrangement with our landholders is that they get a veggie box each week during the season and then they also cover the cost of the water. So we're just connected to like the mains off their house and it's it's around ten dollars that they would be paying for the water cost and then getting like a 25 or 45 dollar um value of veggies per week um so that's been pretty good i guess the thing about building equity is like a really interesting thing like what you mentioned katie and Carl. i'm really keen to hear more about how the work with grounded that you're doing is like going to address this because yeah it feels like while we're learning so many skills from like farming in this particular way and we do sign five-year leases with people there still is that feeling of it all would like circumstances could change and like as young people like we don't have like it's hard to keep up with rent prices in Canberra let alone buying a house like mm. so yeah but then I guess I also think about how like understanding what our purpose is with the farm and um i remember reading an article like maybe six months ago and it was talking about how we have around four and a half years to really address climate change before it runs away and is um impossible and yeah understanding our purpose with the farm i think really plays into that and like i guess we're trying to now decide are we going to be an urban farm that can really bring in lots of other new growers that want to learn how to do it and potentially do it on a bigger scale somewhere else and rely on grants to do that or do we want to use other income streams mm. um, to support ourselves in our own right and I guess like one of the benefits of being a collective of four people at the moment is like a lot of us have a particular passion and so we have the room to like start growing more seedlings or start composting more and just experiment a bit with what we're doing so yeah and yeah, having those kind of um I guess yeah those roles those solidified roles based upon what you're interested in and what your skills are it's like massive benefit from a model like that yeah um before we get to a q and a I just wanted to hear about Carl can you pop in quickly <laughs> I was running out of time I knew this was gonna happen <laughs> Yeah, yeah, great uh, listening in to everyone. And um, as uh, one of those wretched uh, land economists, um, I hear and feel your pain about contracts. Um, it's got to be something around looking at the um, municipal council rating notice and looking at the site value component of the land and coming up with a negotiation around that. Um, so that's generally the baseline um, for a contract, whether that's something in the realm of three to 5% um, is, is debatable. I've got a lot of work to do in this space, but um, yeah, I put in a link there about um, community land trusts and the farming aspect, uh, really good processes happening using environmental uh, covenants to um, limit the use of that land um, in America, they've got one that allows um, a farming covenant, but I don't think we've got one here in Australia yet. So that's a direction we need to move towards. Be nice if uh, there was one that um, also had a sub clause, no, um, no hobby uh, farm, um, horse, uh, horse based farms. Uh, God, I see so many unhappy horses around my area. Um, so yeah, there's, uh, 
yeah, there's a lot of movement happening on that farm-based uh, land trust angles. But uh, yeah, Nick's report is a great place to start. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I take my hat off to you all. Well done. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. And so you pop that link in the chat so everyone can access that. It's important work. Thanks so much. And yeah, I feel you on the horse thing. <laughs> Um, and then just really quick, can everyone just think about their questions? Um, and then quickly, just I want to I want to hear from Chloe and Jared just really quickly, guys, just about your context and what's going on with you um, and your situation, please. All right. So we are living on Jared's aunt and uncle's farm. We had an agreement of one year um, where we could farm hand for them, so look after goats, look after the property, keep everything maintained, do fencing, all of that. Um, and in return, we would get to live in a little self-contained cottage and have half an acre to grow veggies on. Um, and after a couple of months, they very kindly changed the agreement from one year to indefinitely. Um, I think they were just really stoked to have people who have the same values. I mean, we've talked a lot about personality clashes. They were really worried about that kind of thing, but we all have the same values and ideas. So we're here for good. Um, very excited. Yeah, uh, pretty uh, pretty lucky and privileged. Uh, probably a terrible example of no contracts and winging it. But so far, it's working with great communication. And also agree about the horse thing. We comment on that every time we see horses. <laughs> oh, so good. I'm so glad that you guys have um, got that all sorted. Hey, it's like so exciting. It was so nice to meet you. It feels like ages ago now when you popped in on the farm. It's so great to see you guys starting up your own thing. I and remember, yeah. Eliza, I remember you said specifically as well to get a contract and <laughs> be really careful <laughs> and do all that stuff. And we yeah. ignore it. Um, no, we sorry. think about it. We think about it. We just... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, can you get a contract now? Get a contract. Yeah, we are in support of contracts. Could you tell I've been burnt before? Just like <laughs> um, thanks, guys. So good. Okay, so um, Q and A. Does anybody have any questions, comments that they want to put out? This has been such an awesome um, conversation. I'm so uh, yeah, everybody. Thank you so much for being so generous with your stories and experiences. There's lots to think about after this. Um, questions. Jess, do you see anyone with anyone with any hands up? Can I say something, Liza? Yes. It's Rosemary. You've met me before. Mickey's. Oh, hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. Listen, I come from a horticulture background and permaculture, but I've got some heroes that really inspire me, and one of them is Joe Sparker. Mm with his greenhouse and now he's got a movie so with your resources and things you should do a movie like I can't remember who the guy was that did the move the film that you know that Joe had in the um greenhouse at the back of Federation Square with zero oh. waste they yep. filmed it and now okay, it's out cool. all right well I'll have a look at it but that sounds great I haven't actually seen it yeah well he's it's out now um and then Charlie Arnett's really good with his podcasts. Yeah, his podcast is great. And things like that. And there's also... Um, is it called the, it's the Regenerative... regenerative farmer, yeah. Regenerative I Farmer um, podcast, yeah. yeah. To anybody? Regenerative Journey. Yeah, that's yes, it. that's it. And the other person that's really good um, is um, Peter Andrews yeah. and how he reads the landscape. Yeah. So... And it's been. So you mean you're, you're saying like we should give not only you know this sharing of stories and stuff in terms of our resource bank, but like linking into people that are doing good work in the field and stuff like that too. Well, it's like Joyce. She's mentoring people. These people are my heroes, and they're just they're just you know. And who else is there? There's Charlie Massey. Um, he's yeah. really good. There's all these really good resources, and there's courses and things like that. But it's, it's a learning curve for all of us. And all I want to do is say, keep up the good work, everybody. And <laughs> Thank you, it's so important, but you need to even have farm visits and get people that way and connecting or whatever. Do you know what I mean? But even making a film, a short film of a couple of you together, 
yeah as if that would work yeah thanks so much rosemary well um i've written them all down we'll see how we go with your recommendations thank you there's okay. deb deb oh is that mads but lucy and deb as well so Lucy and Deb. So we'll go deb first Hi, hi, Eliza. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm here with Rach and Madison, a couple of friends. We're, um, we're up here in Mildura in um, Victoria and uh, Rach and I are members of Food Next Door Co-op, which um, I co-founded and, and ran for a few years. And um, I wanted to pick up on a, on a couple of things that I've heard when we started. So Food Next Door Co-op um, provides access to land for new migrants and uh, former refugees who come from farming backgrounds and don't have the resources to access land. And when we set up, um, I think it was Josh who was saying, like, we had no models or examples um, at that time and, and developed our own land share agreements, um, sort of put together from conversations we had with other people who were sort of trying to do something similar but I'm I just I wanted to reflect that I'm really overwhelmed at how much of this is going on and yes it's still new but it feels like there's this critical mass of um, people all trying to find these different ways of accessing land to farm and um, and how wonderful that is and I also wanted to echo what Joyce said earlier that um, for us here in Sunraysia, uh, there also is no shortage of land and no shortage of really generous people in the community who would, who would love an opportunity for people to farm on their land. But having that example of it working um, in your community and where you are is really, really important. So for Food Next Door, um, the, the first plot of land that we had has now led to about, I think we're up to about four different um, landowners with land share agreements um, for people to farm on their land. So thanks. Thanks, thanks Deb. That's awesome. Yeah, I've totally um, feel what you're saying about this ripe moment. I feel like there's some, like my head is exploding right now with ideas and I think that, yeah, we can get some things happening for sure so thank you so much that sounds like such an interesting project um and lucy hi everyone uh i'm lucy i work for southern harvest association um so we're a canberra bungandore based not-for-profit member-run farmer-led organization so we work with a lot of small farmers in our area um and partly why we worked with AFSA um, in getting this uh, solidarity session started was that we sort of identified that we had a lot of the farmers and landholders in our um, in our organization who were interested in land sharing agreements or having having people come to farm on their land and people who've been considering it for quite a while as a as a way to incorporate um, younger farmers or landless farmers into their um, into their land or into whatever they've got going on um but overwhelmingly and this seems to be a bit of a theme the land is there but the people to farm it are not necessarily so i wondered if anyone had any thoughts about um places to be reaching out to people or like how how we can be better engaging both you know individually as land holders but also as an organization like southern harvest how we can be finding people um who who are looking to take on some of that land Thanks. It's been a really great session and I've enjoyed hearing from everyone. Thanks, Lucy. Does anybody have um, any advice for Lucy in that regard? I can just quickly answer that, um, Lucy, with what we did. We, um, I won't go through the process because I know we're over time now, but we, we're going to create a resource um, as part of this funding that we got about how we found lessees. Uh, and in the meantime, I've put my email address in the um, in the chat. So if you want to just email me, I can send you a bunch of resources about how we did it. Cool. Awesome. Um, and Lil, thanks, Katie. Lil. Oh, hi. So I didn't realise I put my hand up. I'm just driving. Um, <laughs> but I will. Just, I'll just say on the back of Luz, what Lucy said. Yeah, I totally agree. And the, but the challenge is actually finding accommodation um, close to where you're farming is a challenge 
Mm -hmm. um, and maybe close to your work if you if you have an off off farm job, and just the logistics if you live away from where you're actually farming, and um, that can actually compromise you know your output and just your organization. It's just like an, an extra challenge. So yeah. trying to match up the right location with the right people so it's like a sustainable arrangement yeah. for your you know bottom line as a farmer is um a huge challenge and just something you know one of the other main things to put out there the, the complications that we have to deal with <laughs> as young yeah. farmers yeah yeah for sure Lil um and I guess if we can start to collect some of these stories of lived experiences from people who have been in that kind of situation as well that would help I guess yeah I guess in just getting ideas about how to figure that out really yeah for sure yeah Thanks. okay is there anybody else um hang on I've just lost the screen I think we're good lads okay cool um well I will wrap things up then oh so good thank you so much everybody um for coming and listening it's been such an awesome chat um before we head off um I really hope that this has been an energizing conversation for you all and if you're keen to be involved in more discussions on FUPL and food sovereignty um this is just a reminder a little plug that AFSA will be holding its food sovereignty convergence on Bundjalung country at Echo Valley Farm in Gumbara, um Queensland on the 17th and 18th of October um, this will be the first in-person convergence since 2019. So we're keen to make this one the best one yet and galvanize the food sovereignty movement even further. Convergence is open to all. So you're all invited to come along and pass the invite on to your mates and your networks. Jess has popped a link in the chat here for tickets and more, in, um, more event info as well. Um, and if you've enjoyed tonight's session, Convergence will launch some of the other exciting projects that AFSA um, has been working on this year which includes um, the revised people's food plan draft, a legal guide for AFSA members, um, the draft of that, um, AFSA values and theory of change, and then also um, eating democracy survey um, research and their, its new book announcements, really exciting. You might all remember farming democracy. Um, well, there's an eating democracy coming. So it's super, super exciting. Um, We'd love you all to come along and offer your input. So we hope that any of you can make it if you can make it to Brizzy. Um, other than that, uh, yeah, just thanks so much again for everyone that's involved in this conversation. It seems like, yeah, it's a ripe time um, to do some work in this sphere. And um, I mean, it's gonna be super important um, in order for us, the security of our food in the future. So I, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, and I hope you have a fantastic evening. Bye.